in Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8. Um, as usual, the phone number at the top right-hand corner is, uh, you can send a text message there. Um, if you have questions about <clears throat> anything we're studying, and maybe you don't feel comfortable uh, speaking up in a, in a class setting. All right, so this chapter is, whereas chapter 7 dealt with the four major world empires, this one focuses in on the middle two. Okay, we're focusing in on the middle two of Medo-Persia and Greece, and this is one of those chapters where we're not really left to wonder how to interpret the animals because we're told. And so it, <clears throat> it makes our job a whole lot easier uh, in doing some of those things. And so uh, we're just zooming in on those two kingdoms. And the reason why we're zooming in on those two kingdoms is because really there's a guy that we mentioned, I think, early on, early, early on, um, <clears throat> that I said he would become significant, and he will, um, on in, in this chapter and then in 10, 11, and 12, and become very significant throughout Jewish, uh, what we call intertestament history, um, and that's Antiochus IV Epiphanes. <clears throat> and so we're introduced to him tonight, and uh, we'll learn some things about him. Uh, in the process so uh, but that will have a direct effect upon the people the Jews to whom Daniel is writing and so that's why a number uh, a good deal of information is given to us uh, about him <clears throat> so in this chapter it um, we have the vision and we have the interpretation but it's one of those instances where the vision gives you certain details and then the interpretation adds on details um, and so I'm not exactly sure the, <laughs> I've been rolling it over in my mind, the best way to go about this. So I think what we're going to do is read the whole chapter and put it in front of us just because it helps us to see the whole. And then <clears throat> we can uh, walk through some of the details as they arise to us. So I realize it's a little bit more lengthy of a reading, but I think it's important. Uh, let's just see the whole thing in front of us. <clears throat> So, chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. In the third year of the reign of King uh, Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after which appeared to me at the first, speaking of chapter 7. And I saw in the vision, and when I saw, <clears throat> I was in Susa, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision, and I was at the Uli Canal. I raised my eyes and saw, and behold, a ram standing on the bank of the canal. It had two horns, and both horns were high. One was higher than the other. And the higher one came up last. <clears throat> I saw the ram charging westward and northward and southward. No beast could stand before him, and there was no one who could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. As I was considering, behold, a male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came to the ram <clears throat> with two horns, which I had seen standing on the bank of the canal. And he ran at him in his powerful wrath, and I saw him come close to the ram, and he was enraged against him, and struck the ram, and broke his two horns, and the ram had no power to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled on him, and there was no one who could rescue the ram from his power. Then the goat became exceedingly great, but when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and instead of it, there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven." Uh, out of one of them came a little horn which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. It grew great even to the host of heaven, and some of the host and some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. It became great, even as great as the prince of hosts, and the regular burnt offering was taken away from him, um, <clears throat> and the place of his sanctuary was overthrown, and the host were given over to it together, and the regular burnt offering because of the transgression." And it will throw truth to the ground, and it will act and prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the one who spoke, For how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, Twenty-three hundred evenings and mornings. Then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state." When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it, and behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, and it called Gabriel. 
Make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, O son of man, that this vision is for the time of the end. And when he had spoken to me, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and made me stand up. He said, Behold, I will make known to you what shall be in the latter end of the indignation, for it refers to the appointed time of the end. As for the ram that you saw with the two horns, these are the kings of Media and Persia, and the goat is the king of Greece, and the great horn between his eyes is the first king. As for the horn that was broken in the place of which four others arose, four kingdoms shall arise from his nation, but not with his power. And at the latter end of their kingdom, when the, transgression, the transgressors have reached their limit, a king of bold face and who understands riddles shall arise. His power shall be great, but not by his own power, and he shall cause fearful destruction and shall succeed in what he does and destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints." By his cunning he shall <clears throat> make deceit prosper under his hand, and in his own hand he shall become great. Without warning he shall destroy many, and <clears throat> he shall even rise up against the prince of princes, and he shall be broken, but by no human hand. The vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been told is true, and, but seal up the vision, for it refers to many days from now. And I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for some days. Then I rose and went about the king's business, but I was appalled by the vision and did not understand it. All right. <clears throat> so, third year of King Belshazzar. You remember, Belshazzar is the king in chapter 5 when uh, the Babylonian Empire is overthrown. So we're kind of going backward in history, so to speak. And you remember that chapter 7 transpired in the first year of King Belshazzar. So these two visions are still taking place. Babylon is still in control uh, at this particular point. The year here would be around 548 to 547 BC. Okay. <clears throat> so a vision appeared to Daniel uh, after that which appeared to me at the first, talking about chapter 7. He says, I saw in the vision and when I saw I was in Susa the citadel which is in the province of Elam. Susa was, a ca was the capital city of Elam. Um, <clears throat> so the question here is um, concerning Susa. Susa is a very significant city later on. We read about uh, Nehemiah with the king in Susa, the citadel, Nehemiah 1.1. Again, um, Esther, the book of Esther. The king summons all the people <clears throat> to Susa, the citadel. It became the capital of Medo-Persia in 521 B.C., okay? But this is 548. It had not become a palace yet. It was a significant city, <clears throat> somewhat, but not super important. So that has led people to wonder, and when you study Daniel 8 with... <clears throat> some other key visions in Revelation and Ezekiel that maybe, and I'm not denying the possibility that Daniel is physically in the city of Susa. That may be what's going on. But there's also the possibility that he is simply being transported. Visions allow you to be transported in them, okay? Like Ezekiel, when he sees the Valley of Dry Bones, God transports him to that valley to show him and to, to communicate with him. And so... Um, <clears throat> There are some things to think about there. Susa is about 200 miles from Babylon, which is, uh, I think if you were to drive it today, it'd take about six hours, um, is from what I was uh, reading anyway. And so a pretty significant distance, especially in that time, a couple of weeks to travel probably. Um, <clears throat> so those are some things to consider about Susa the Citadel. Is he being transported in the vision or is he actually there? It doesn't really change a lot, uh, but it is something to think about. <clears throat> it says, I saw in the vision, and I was at the Ulai Canal. Prophets many times see visions at canals and in waters. Um, Ezekiel 3, the prophet Ezekiel preaches many times by the Kibar Canal. Uh, some older translations will say river, but it's a canal or an irrigation type um, source. So here he is, and he says, I raised my eyes and saw, and behold, a ram standing on the bank of the canal. Now, a ram was commonly associated with the Medo-Persian Empire. As a matter of fact, the, the Medo-Persian kings 
would wear a helmet with ram's horns on it as they led their armies into battle. Um, <clears throat> so this association with rams in the Medo-Persian Empire is, is something that I think they would have naturally picked up on. But then he says it has two horns, and both horns were high, but one was higher than the other. Okay. Now, we kind of saw a little bit of this in chapter 7. Um, in chapter 7 and verse 5, talking about the Medes and the Persians, you remember he said, And behold, another beast, a second one, like a bear, it was raised up on one side. And we talked about the significance of that, that the Medes and the Persians are they're united, but they're always mentioned separately, if that makes sense. Okay? They're one group, but the Medes, the Persians conquered the Medes. Or, wait, yeah, that's right. Is that right? It's been a long week already. Um, yeah, Cyrus the Great. Okay, so <clears throat> anyway, so the Medes were a pretty significant group, and then Cyrus and the Persians took them. And so they were two significant groups. They were united together. Cyrus actually captured them from his own grandfather. And people say, well, that's, that's pretty harsh. Yeah, but his grandfather tried to kill him. So, I mean, it wasn't like there was this great, uh, you know, paternal relationship that was taking place between the two of them. So he takes it over, and the Persians kind of become the dominant figure. And so you have the two horns that come up high, and one is still higher. Uh, and when you look at the bear that's raised up on one side, <clears throat> a lot of times that is understood in that regard to uh, the way the Medes and the Persians operated. So what we're seeing is the rise of the Medo-Persian Empire. And what's interesting is <clears throat> at the time that Daniel is seeing this, the ram with the two horns, the Medo-Persian Empire, is going out and conquering at that very moment. Like, they're rising. At this very moment, they're rising. As a matter of fact, in chapter 7, um, <clears throat> this is when... Remember, chapter 7, we mentioned in the first year of King Belshazzar, which would have been 550, 549. That's the year that Cyrus, translation Cyrus the Great, the leader of the Persian Empire, uh, that's when he began his, to usurp the throne and to take over Persia and then would lead to taking over Media and then taking over the rest of the world. And so we see that mentioned here when it says, <clears throat> uh, the higher one came up last, I saw the ram charging westward, northward, and southward. Okay? So the Medes and the Persians are going out to conquer. And they're going in all directions. Now I think your uh, workbooks, Whitworth will give you some ideas of... Um, <clears throat> some of the, the nations that would be considered westward, northward, southward. And, and I think there's certainly significance to that. I don't know that that's exactly what we're meant to see from it. Okay? If he's going westward and northward and southward, what is it saying? He's going everywhere. He's from the east. Okay? So he's just going everywhere else. Um, and so while I don't think it's wrong to look and see that he certainly conquered in all of those directions, I, I, I get this, tend this feeling that maybe we're, we're pressing that a little bit too hard uh, when we try and assign specific things to that. I think the basic point is he's going out and he's conquering the known world in every direction. And um, <clears throat> so that's what the Medes and the Persians are seen as doing. It says, and no beast could stand before him, and there was no one who could rescue from his power, but he did as he pleased, and he became great. So the Medo-Persian Empire rises, it lasts a couple hundred years, and uh, of course Babylon, as we saw in chapter 5, is going to fall to them, and Daniel in chapter 6 is going to serve <clears throat> uh, under their authority, and so that's the first thing that he sees. Then he says, as I was considering, behold, a male goat came from the west. Okay, So somebody's coming from the west of the, of the um, Medo-Persian Empire. And he's coming across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground. Is that normal? I mean, I've been chased by a goat, but... If the thing is 
hovering above the ground chasing me, it's a whole different level, right? <laughs> like, either something is wrong with that goat or I'm experiencing something inside of me that's not normal. Uh, <clears throat> the point, I think, that's being made here of him coming without touching the ground is, is the same point that was made in chapter 7 when the Greek empire is pictured as a leopard with wings and it's moving with speed. And so <clears throat> he's moving so quickly, it's like, his feet don't even touch the ground. And uh, I think, and of course it's interpreted for us, this is talking about the Greek Empire, and, uh, or what will become the Greek Empire. <clears throat> and so Greece, of course, was in the west, and it was coming west across to conquer um, the, Med the Medo-Persian Empire along with many others. So, <clears throat> without touching the ground, and the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes, he came to the ram with two horns. So the goat, the conspicuous horn between his eyes, is most likely the one who united the Greek Empire, which is Alexander the Great. Okay, So he unites the Greek Empire, and he sends them in an invasion. And it takes him about a total of three years and three major battles. Um, oops. A total of three years and three major battles in order to overthrow... Um, the Medo-Persian Empire. Now, <clears throat> it says in verse 6 that he came to the ram with two horns, which I had seen standing at the bank of the canal, and he ran at him with powerful wrath. I saw him come close to the ram, and he was enraged against him and struck the ram and broke his two horns. Okay, so he's enraged against him. That, <clears throat> In essence, when Daniel's watching it, it's almost like the goat has a vendetta. Like it's personal. It's not just a normal, it doesn't seem to be just this normal interaction or fight. This is personal. And that most likely we'll see some details of this come out in chapter 11. But I think we've mentioned it already before. Okay. <clears throat> so when es the book of Esther opens, the king is having this giant banquet. All right. Now, in the context of the book, it gives us the setting for how Vashti will eventually become queen. That's really what the way the writer of Esther is using it. But <clears throat> it begins with this great festival that's lasting a really long time. Well, what the king is actually doing there is raising support for an invasion into Greece okay, that will transpire. Now, <clears throat> if you notice in chapter 1, the king is pretty callous about Vashti. You know, he takes the advice and says, let's remove her, whatever. And in chapter 2, he kind of starts, maybe that wasn't the smartest move. Well, if you're just reading the book of Esther and not looking at anything else behind the world of the text, you might think, well, he just had a change of heart. Well, he certainly did, but... There's a pretty significant thing that happened in between chapters 1 and 2, historically speaking. He invaded Greece and got his tail whipped. He led a massive invasion into Greece and was beat like a drum. Um, <clears throat> and so now he has been humbled. Now that experience is, was the rallying cry that Alexander would use for their invasion into Medo-Persia. It was about defending the, the honor of the Greek Empire. And so it, even though the Medes and the Persians never conquered the Greeks, it was still considered a, it was, per, it was a personal vendetta to him to take down the Medo-Persian Empire for all the trouble they had caused. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so that sense of coming at it with rage, that's the way Alexander fought. He was a madman. Okay? in that sense, when he fought. It was personal to him. And uh, he became king only at the age of 20 and died at 32, just shy of 33. Um, <clears throat> so here he is, he's leading this, and um, the way he wins these battles, he has no business winning them. He's just that smart. He's just that... He's a gifted leader, okay, in, in many different levels. And he was a gifted individual when it came to understanding how battle worked and using things to your advantage, using terrain to your advantage, um, because <clears throat> uh, 
especially in this time, people thought that numbers, that was it. If you had more soldiers, you could win. Well, the Greeks had known a long time that you can find a way to, to make numbers irrelevant. Right? As a matter of fact, in this first invasion uh, <clears throat> of the Persians into the Greek Empire, uh, there was a movie made about it a few years ago. Uh, Gerard Butler was in it. It's kind of like his come out movie, but 300. It's about the Battle of Thermopylae. Okay, that's, that's, we're actually going to see reference to that in chapter 11. Um, so the basic premise of it is based on a true story, not the way they tell it necessarily, but it's based in, in true events. Um, so <clears throat> you've got a massive fighting force of Persians, and you've got Leonidas, who's the Spartan king, and he can only take with him 300, which are his personal bodyguard. The, the council in the city won't let him take a full army because, well, for a number of different reasons, but one, the one they're using is that it's a holiday. It's a holiday to the gods, and so you can't take everybody. So he goes, and they take him, and he takes his personal bodyguard of 300, and they go into, and a matter of fact, in the movie, you'll hear it referred to as the hot gates. Okay, the hot gates. Well, that's the Battle of Thermopylae. Okay, therma is heat. Polis, Thermopylae, polis is city. Okay, so the hot city, the hot gate. And so basically what they did was... <clears throat> The Spartans forced them to meet. They would not come out in an open field to them. They forced them to come into a narrow pass between mountains to fight. Okay? And so <clears throat> the way Spartans fought was the, you, you fought as a unit. You didn't want to meet them on their own, but you certainly didn't want to meet them as a unit. Okay? So they had their shields. As a matter of fact, their shields were so important that if a Spartan dropped his shield in battle, he lost his, his citizenship. Okay? You depended on the person next to you because what they would do is they could move as one continuous unit. And so they would all lock shield and then drop and then spear, take a step forward after they killed that line, and then shield as, the, as they tried to attack again, drop the shield, spear, kill them, move forward. They were an unstoppable force once you did that. <clears throat> and so what they did was they forced the Persian Empire to meet them there. And the reason they did that was because now numbers are irrelevant. You can send line after line after line all you want to, and we're just going to kill them. Okay? And so <clears throat> the Greeks have a long history of being very skilled in warfare. And Alexander uses that. And that's how he rises very quickly and takes down the Medo-Persian kings. <clears throat> All right. So <clears throat> he comes after it and he's enraged against them and he struck the ram and broke his two horns. And the ram had no power to stand before him. And he cast him down to the ground and trampled on him. And there was no one who could rescue the ram from his power. So he... Uh, like we say, three years to overtake an empire is pretty swift. It's pretty swift. Um, and then it says, the goat became exceedingly great. Uh, the Greek empire, excuse me, under Alexander, covered one, uh, 1 1.5 million square miles from Europe to India. Okay? And it's not because he wanted to stop, it's because he just wore his soldiers out and they basically told him, look, we got to stop. Uh, we got to take a break at least. And so <clears throat> he conquers um, a great portion of the known world uh, at his time. So it says, but when he was strong, the great horn was broken. So when Alexander was strong, the great horn was broken. When he's at the height of his power, he dies, June 13th, 323. To this day, no one really, really knows what happened to him. Um, some people think it was a, he contracted malaria, some of the issues that come along with that. Some people think he was assassinated. Some people, I mean, theory after theory, no way of, of knowing. Point is, he dies, and he dies very young, just shy of 33. Um, <clears throat> and so, what happens then? Well, his wife is pregnant. Okay. He has no 
heir at that moment because his wife is pregnant. He has an illegitimate son, but illegitimate children can't assume the throne. Um, so the wife and the baby are killed, and basically it's just chaos. Okay? And that's why it says, <clears throat> instead there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. Uh, there are differences of opinions here. Some people think that Alexander's empire was broken into four kingdoms. Uh, historically, that's pretty hard to, to prove because it was more like 39 people vying for it, and then you know they kill each other down to like 30, and then you're get... So <clears throat> I don't know if that's necessarily the point is that it's divided specifically into four kingdoms as much as it is is like saying it just went everywhere as united as the kingdom was and as, as much land as they had when alexander died it just turned into straight chaos everywhere okay now <clears throat> there were two that are going to be focused in and we're going to we're going to read more about not by name but historically we understand who they are and those are the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. Okay? The Ptolemies and the Seleucids. So in understanding this, in understanding Alexander's empire, um, <clears throat> we're starting to understand some things that the New Testament is going to start making more sense. Okay? Uh, things we're reading about in the New Testament are going to start making more sense. So, <clears throat> the Greek Empire takes over. I think we've mentioned it before. Alexander is called the Apostle of Hellenism. Hellenism, Hellenistic life, is a Greek way of life. And their goal, his goal was to spread it all over the world. <clears throat> the Greek way of thought. Um, which we as a nation adopt many things from Hellenistic culture. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, he goes through and he sets up learning centers all throughout the world. For an example, the most notorious of um, learning centers was in Alexandria. You can hear his name, right? Alexandria, Alexander, Alexandria, Egypt. Um, and it wasn't just a learning center during his, his day. It's one of the famed, I mean, it outlived him a long way. It's one of the famed... Um, <clears throat> one of the uh, one of the famed libraries of the world that was burned, um, but you remember, okay, in Acts eighteen at the end of that chapter, we're introduced to this guy named Apollos, who is an eloquent man and mighty in Scripture. He's from Alexandria. There's a reason he's an eloquent man and he's a gifted orator. He studied at Alexandria, okay? That dates back to Alexander the Great. He started this whole process. Furthermore, <clears throat> the language of the New Testament is what? It's Greek. It was the language that united the empire. It, as a matter of fact, the language of the New Testament is a specific dialect of Greek called koine. Koine, okay? For an example, the term uh, community or fellowship is the Greek term koinonia. Koine, koinonia. Can you hear, you hear the similarities in the terms? Okay. So koine simply means common. It's common Greek. It's, it's the baseline of, of, of all the other forms and dialects that break off of it. And almost everyone can speak it. Okay. Furthermore, <clears throat> when we come to Acts chapter 6, and you remember there's this dispute about the Hellenists coming and saying that their widows have been neglected in the daily ministration of the church. Who are the Hellenists? Who are the Grecian widows? They're Jews that accepted some of this Hellenistic culture. They're people that, 
chose to learn to speak Greek instead of staying with Hebrew. They're people that accepted some of these customs that were brought upon them. Um, so a lot of things we read in the New Testament and that we take for granted, it's, it's starting here. Why do you have in the New Testament, why do you have Herodians and Pharisees and Sadducees? You don't ever see them, but there are Essenes, and the reason you don't see Essenes is because they're reclusive. They live out in the desert. So why do you, why do you have the, these groups? It's Greek culture. They all develop their, their break-offs of different judgments about how you're, we're supposed to handle the Greek way of life being imposed upon us. Um, as a matter of fact, Antiochus will be one of the ones who will impose this Greek way of life upon the Jews. Which means, <clears throat> number one, they're gonna, he's going to get them to reject circumcision. By the way, circumcision is one of the most important discussions in all of the New Testament. One of the most, not just from the Jewish side, from the Greek side. Okay? One of the most important discussions in all the New Testament. Where do we get gymnasiums from? It's Greek. Gumnazo. To exercise. Actually, it literally means gumnazo. The idea is exercising naked because that's how the Greeks did it. Um... <clears throat> So you have the imposition there upon them, the imposition of the language. They start meddling with how the priesthood is ordered and structured. Okay, So why is it then when we come to the New Testament that we've got, how do we have multiple high priests at one time? You've got Greek meddlings that are taking place. People are selling the high priesthood. So, <clears throat> people say, what does this have to do with chapter 8? Well, everything. People say, this doesn't have anything to do with, with me. I, I'm a Christian now in the 21st century. But yes, it does have everything to do with us. Because this is culture. Look, it doesn't happen like the world of the Bible didn't just exist in this bubble that wasn't affected by any exterior events. And understanding the world of Scripture changes the way we understand it. And in changing the way we understand it, it changes the way that we then understand how to live and apply what we're studying. Okay? So, <clears throat> what we're reading about is something that's going to have a huge effect uh, on a number of different issues. So, <clears throat> in... Um, Okay, so I've got a question right here about the uh, religious sects. Um, okay, so the question is, are the religious sects connected to the tribes of the Old Testament? Um, as far as my understanding is that they're not. Um, they don't, there doesn't seem to be a connection. Um, now... Some of the tribes were more liberal in their thinking and more conservative in their thinking. And so they, they may have more naturally gravitated to certain groups. Uh, but as far as a, a, a direct uh, connection, um, I, I, don't, I don't know of a direct correlation that exists. A good portion of it comes out of this, uh, <clears throat> out of this issue at hand. Um, but it's a good, really good question. Um, so let's 
uh, anybody have anything else before we, we've got just a few minutes, we can press forward. All right. <clears throat> so out of them came a little horn. Out of one of them came a little horn. So this is very similar to what we saw in the previous chapter. Although the little horn in the previous chapter came up off of the fourth empire. This is the horn, a little horn coming up off the third empire. So it's not dealing with the same person. But a horn being a powerful king. And this is um, Antiochus IV Epiphanes, as he is called. Okay? He grew exceedingly strong toward the south and toward the east and toward the glorious land. The glorious land is Palestine uh, or the nation of Israel. Uh, especially in the eyes. And you can see that in a couple of places like uh, Jeremiah 319, Psalm 106, 24, some of those places. It says, He grew great even to the host of heaven, and some of the hosts of heaven and some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. Okay, so this is obviously apocalyptic in its, in its nature. So stars, <clears throat> the throwing down of stars and... and um, like planets or moons and constellations and things along those lines. And apocalyptic literature many times has reference to the rulers of a nation. And so he's casting them down. Um, I think of um, Isaiah 34 and then uh, maybe Matthew 24. That's, I can't call it off the top of my head, but that for some reason that's sticking in my brain. Um, <clears throat> so he's taking these rulers and he's casting them down. And it says, And he became great, even as great as the prince of the hosts. Um, which there's debate about exactly who the prince of the host is. Is this talking about God? Is it talking about archangels? Is it talking about the high priest? Um, he's certainly exalting himself as God. Um, so his name, Antiochus the Fourth. Epiphanes, that last part there. Does that, listen to the term again, Epiphanes, does that sound like any English words you recognize? Not, sorry? Epiphany. And an epiphany, and I, something just appears to you, like it manifests to you, okay? Um, <clears throat> but that root, that word and its origins, that's the way we use epiphany. But the word itself and its origins has reference to the appearance of a God. Okay? Um, <clears throat> and even in the New Testament, uh, um, the term itself has reference to even the appearing of Jesus. Yeah. So, for an example, Titus 2 and verse 13, waiting for our blessed hope and the appearing of of, our, of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. The term appear, appearing is the Greek term for epiphany. Okay? Um, <clears throat> he is, so he is 160s BC. He is Greek. He is a break off of one of these many. Um, divisions, but he's much later. As a matter of fact, he's one of the last ones. He's one of the last uh, rulers. Uh, Rome kind of starts exerting its will from this point forward. Um, <clears throat> so, in naming himself Epiphanes, he's saying, I'm manifest God. I'm God in the flesh. That's what he's saying. See that? And that becomes a common way of thinking. Augustus Caesar, the august one, the appearance of God. Um, yes. He, he puts himself up, he gives himself that name, and then the Jews actually alter his name and call him Epimedes, which means madman. Because that's exactly what he was. Uh, he was absolutely crazy. So, uh, but we will <clears throat> dive more into that and I'll bore you more with that next week. Um, uh, any questions or anything else before we're... Do they function under the idea of divine right of kings? 
to a degree, they felt in certain ways they were a manifestation of the gods, whether they were cer certainly, whether they considered themselves gods, that's a little murky, right? Um, so he's one of the breakoffs of the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, and they were always at war, and the Jews was, the Israel was the area where they always went to war. And so that's why they become uh, very focused for us here. All right.